Okay, so we've got four people here so far. Might do a quick sound check. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, thank you, Wayne. I'll open the chat window so I can see, see the chat window. Okay, that's all good. Um, so this week's all on GUI and event handling. So good stuff, good fun stuff, hopefully. Um, the, the GUI and event handling weeks are always uh, among the most popular, I think, I hope, because that's when people can start developing nice applications, not just you know, nasty looking console applications. So all on GUI stuff. And uh, the students who were with me last term in the prior course, we did uh, two weeks of GUI programming and um, we built lots of stuff in class and had lots of fun. So it's all continu continuing on from that as well as a quick revision of the basics. Okay, so we're gonna build on what we did last, last in the last course. Okay, um, so last week was polymorphism. This week it's all GUI and event handling. And the same lecture, lecture materials this week and next week. So we'll cover it all this week and then next week we'll have just a practice for doing GUI stuff. And um, if you've got any problems, bring them along. If you've got any questions, bring them along. Um, if you've got any tutorial issues, bring them along. Okay, so next week will be a, a, a bit of a revision week and we'll do any more GUI programming that you need to do to bring you up to where you want to be. Okay. So I'll talk about JFrames and displaying images, Lambda expressions, event handling. And we'll look at specifying listeners concisely. And a, whole and, a, and a few GUI components as well thrown in. Okay, so in the, in the pre-rec, we're in a prior course, we looked at J frames, J labels, J buttons, checkboxes, radio buttons, combo boxes. We talked about layout managers, border layout and flow layout. And we looked at event handling. So they're, they're all the things we did in the prior course. And uh, as well as this related topics like file IO and, and things like that. So we're uh, going to be building on this in this course. So some of the methods we've looked at for JFrame already uh, help us set the location of the frame. In other words, where the frame is on screen and set location, set bounds, set resizable are methods to control the look of the, of the, or the position of the, the frame, the size of the frame, and whether you can resize it or not, set resizable. So um, if you had a, a typical sort of GUI class or, or a template, um, it might look something like this. So we've got week four or five, um, public class week four or five extends JFrame. And then we've got a, a public followed by week four or five. So that's our, uh, our default constructor. And then there's many ways to lay out your code from now on, okay? So um, uh, this is one way. This is one way that we're taught in this course, but there's other ways as well. So if your textbook does it a different way, don't panic, there's, there's many ways to do stuff. <laughs> okay, so, um, so we're creating an object based on our class. So whatever that, whatever that class name there is, is the same as that name. And we're creating an object of it here. Calling it app equals new week four or five, GUI, whatever it is. And then we can use this object, whatever this object here is, to set the title, the size, the, the default close operation, whether it's visible or not, and any other thing we like as well. For example, we could call set resizable, set bounds, set location, a whole lot of stuff we could be calling. Okay. So by default, when you, when you close a Java GUI application, when you click a little X icon, it hides the application, it doesn't close it. So to override that operation, you need to say, set default close operation to exit on close. And that's a constant built into the JFrame class. So it's JFrame.exit on close. If, you're, if, you're, if your code doesn't have that somewhere or some sort of exit procedure, then your GUI program will just hide. It'll become invisible, but it'll still be running. Okay, so don't forget that, especially for the early stuff we do. Um, and in, in, the, in the prior course, we looked at how to override the close handler so that you could display a dialogue and, and save data and that when the user wanted to exit. So that's something in the prior course as well. And then the last thing you need to do is set visible to true. So until you do that, your, your applications, your, your GUI is built and it's sized and it's, <laughs> it's, it's got a title, uh, but it's invisible. So you need to say set visible to true. So we run this now. So this, this is a basic skeleton. 
that, that you can start off with for um, you know, all your all your GUI program, programs, if you like. So we've got some imports, import Java X dot swing dot star. So we're bringing in all of the swing basic stuff, AWT dot star, so all of the AWT uh, components and the event handling stuff as well for handling button clicks and mouse clicks. So if we run that now and see what, see what happens, and it'll just be a just be a blank frame with nothing in it. Okay, so the title bar is sized, and um, nothing nothing's there. So if we click the X icon, a little press the new key to continue message will pop up. That's TextPad. That's out of TextPad. TextPad runs our program for us and displays that message to let us know it's ended. So there's nothing here that says press the new key. So it's TextPad producing that or a little a little shell script file that TextPad produces. Um, we also say set location app dot set location, and we want it to be 200 pixels across the screen and 100 pixels from the top or 200 from the top, whatever you want. So they're usually X and Y, so 200 across the screen and 200, this one means 200 down from the top of the screen. Okay, so if I run it again, it just says we're moving it, it's already inside the, inside the recording area. So we've got set title going on, set, haven't got set, I can, if I run it again and just say, I'll show you how you can resize it. Okay, so I can resize the frame. If I, if I put app.set resizable to false. Don't forget that Java is an American language, so you can use American spelling for commands. So sizable with a Z, not an S. Set resizable to false, that means we can't resize the window now. So if I run it again, control one. Don't forget your semicolons, I thought I hit it. Control one, control two. And now if I try and resize it, see, see the, the, the cursor's not even changing to let me know I can resize it, So and I can't resize it. I can click and drag and I can't resize it. Okay, but also the cursor doesn't change, the mouse cursor, which is interesting. So just that one command controlled all of that. I generally let people resize my apps. They can make them whatever size they like. Um, okay, um, you can set title, set the icon image as well. So you can control this little image that appears here, whatever that image there is. At the moment, it's I'm using Adopt Open JDK, a special free version of JDK where no licensing issues apply. And um, so it's a little, um, like, like, like a little tux penguin <laughs> sort of chat is the icon. But if, you, if, you're, if you're running this app on your machine with Java's or Oracle's Java installed, JDK installed, then you'll probably get a coffee cup with the, the steaming lines coming out of it. Okay, so I'm running a special version of Java, which has got no licensing issues in a commercial environment. Because I do commercial Java work. All frames by default have a size of zero by zero. <laughs> if you don't call set size, your frame will still be created, but it'll have no, no width and no height. And, uh, and, and until you say set visible to true, it won't be visible anyway. So. Here we're gonna resize it according to our screen size. So we're saying toolkit equals toolkit, get default toolkit, so we're getting the uh, the, the toolkit for the what, what the Java virtual machine is running in, if you like. And that allows us to get the screen size, so kit.get screen size, and that returns a dimension object. And the, and the dimension's got a height and a width. So we could say int screen height equals screen size dot height, int screen width equals screen size dot width. And then we could set, our, set the size of our application to be half the screen width and half the screen height if we wanted to, okay. And um, set location by platform to true. So you can do stuff like that as well. So if you're running on Mac OS, it'll do whatever the default is for Mac OS if you don't set a position and so on. So set location by platform is, is true. Set the location by default if you don't do this command. Okay. And the default might be the center of the screen. Okay, depends on what OS you're running on. 
Okay, so getting the screen size is quite easy. This only this code here only works for single monitor systems. If you've got a multi-monitor system, you need to just adapt this slightly. It's not much of a change, but you need to just adapt it slightly. And then you can work at the, the total width of all your screens <laughs> and, uh, and the total height of all your screens or the whatever. And then you can position it that way if you'd rather. Okay, but this one will position it halfway centered in your, uh, or half, so it's half the width and half the height of your primary monitor, whatever that primary monitor size might be. So if you've got five monitors, Five, five displays and uh, and one little one and four big ones, this will set your size according to that first primary display. Okay, but adapting that to multi-monitors is pretty easy. It's just a small change. So to add a title and an icon, you can say, um, Frame.set title, for example, here, app.set title. Okay, and that's at the title. And if you want to set an icon image as well to overwrite the default image, you can do that as well. So image image equals new image icon. So you're, you're, here we're doing a little bit of polymorphism. <laughs> we're getting an image icon object and storing it in, a, in an image object. Okay, and Java's happy to do that. Okay, because there is a relationship between these two. So icon and a file name, get image. So that loads the the um, the icon from file. Get image gets the image out of the image icon, which means we can then convert it to a, an image object. And set icon image to image. And we could we could do that here if you wanted. So um, just need to track down a. A quick icon. I'll, I'll grab one I was working on the other day. So it's Felix the cat. <laughs> okay, so let's see if we can make that the image for our application. Image icon equals new image icon. And then we're going to say the name. And don't forget the folder. Images slash. Get images slash. That should do it. Dot get image icon. Get image, image icon. So we're, we're, we're getting an image icon object, loading it from file, and then converting it to an image, or getting the image component of that. And then say set, set icon image to, to icon. Oh, app dot. App dot, don't forget your app dot. And there's a little Felix's head there. You might be able to see it. Uh, I'll zoom in on a video if I can and uh, show in a video. But this, instead of being a little penguin sort of chap, it's now Felix the cat. Um, hasn't come out very well. Uh, these icons are probably something like 32 by 32 characters in size. And so there's not much detail you can fit in 32 by 32 pixels. Not much, not much detail. Um, Okay, and last time I should showed you the other way you can lay out these commands. So instead of putting them down here, you can also put all these in the constructor as well. So let's do that. Okay, but in the constructor, it's not app dot, it's just call a method because we're doing it for the current GUI object, which is our JFrame. Okay, so I can move all those commands up there, take the app dot, off, app dot, app dot off the front, and now I can comment out all this code. And uh, everything will still work exactly the same. And there's that class appearing with our Felix. Okay. So gen generally you'll see, well, you'll, you'll probably see a lot of these commands here generally in the main method like I've got laid out here. Things like setting your icon isn't done very often, but if you do it, it's probably up here in the constructor, but 
like I've just showed you, you can put them in either place. Now that we're not using this object directly, we're not using app dot for anything now, we can even shorten this code a little bit by just saying new. Okay, so we're, we're creating an anonymous uh, class for our, our GUI class. We're not giving it a name. We're just saying call a constructor, I don't care what the name is. Okay, because we're not doing this anymore. This is all done up in our constructor. So let's do that, that's fine. And there's our, everything's still working exactly the same. Is everyone okay with that so far? Any questions? I know, so I've got a question from Jared there. Sorry, Jared. Um, I noticed when I made a second GUI, which I opened inside my main GUI, the exit on close would close both. How would you avoid that? Okay, so um, that's, a, that's a bigger question than I can answer here in... Multi-frame Java projects are sort of an advanced topic. If you, if you look on forums for dealing with multi J-frame classes, a, a lot of the forums say avoid. <laughs> okay, avoid doing it. There's other ways to do it. You can have a single J-frame plus either a tabbed pane or card layout pane. Can give you the same sort of thing as having multiple J frames, and it's a lot simpler code. Okay, but you can have, you can, you can still have um, multi J frame close things if you like. Uh, there's another method you call rather than next on close. That's all. So um, I, I would probably, I would probably just if if they close the second J frame, I would probably just make the, the second J frame go invisible and return back to your first J frame. Okay, but there's other ways you can do it as well. It depends on what you're trying to do and, uh, and so on. But bigger, bigger question I can answer here in class just now. And not something we, re we really cover in this course either. <clears throat> okay, so, um, and instead of calling set title here, okay, you can, you can do this. Uber. Okay, so we're calling, we're now, now we know about inheritance. We're, we're, we're calling the superclass constructor, which is our JFrame constructor, and we're passing through a string. And when Java, when you run that constructor in Java, it, it knows to set the title to whatever you pass through. Okay, so I've got no set title here. I've got no set title there. That's all commented out. I've got a super call instead. And it will still set the title of our JFrame. So as you, as you can see, there's many, there's many ways to do stuff in Java. Okay, but of course, that's got to be the first line of code in your class. You can have comments before it. Control one, everything's still fine. But if I try and put anything before it, like even just declaring an integer, which is really harmless, the call to the superclass must be the first statement in the constructor. Okay, so even just declaring an integer, no, 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 it's got to be the first line of code. The first Java statement. Keep that in mind. I, I, I tend to prefer set title because it avoids all that stuff about having the first statement. I like putting other stuff first in the call, call to the superclass constructor. Okay. But many ways to do stuff. So if your textbook shows you another way, don't panic. Get used to it. There's many ways to do stuff. Um, set default close operation, we've already talked about that. Um, the default operation is to do nothing on close or hide on close. So you, if you click the little X in the top right hand corner, your application just becomes invisible and keeps running. So it doesn't exit. Okay, and here's another way to um, create a, um, to, to do everything. So you still have the main method there, 
but you've got this event queue invoke later. So let's do that as well. We'll do all, then we'll cover it all the ways. copy all this code and put it inside the event queue. The UE dot invoke later, invoke later. It's always a bit of a mouthful setting this up. It's got to be a dot. Um, so we've got in, 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 in choke later, invoke later, that'll do. So we open round brackets, then we've got open round bracket, close round bracket, then we've got a lambda. So we've got a bit of stuff going on in there. And then we've got curly brackets. We've got our close curly brackets, close round brackets, and then we've got the semicolon. Should be pretty close. Uncomment out some code, uncomment out that. Pretty good to me. So this is a, this is a little chap called a lambda. We did talk about those last term, and I showed you how instead of creating the old action formed class for each method or each button you have, um, how you can just link it straight to a, straight to a, an event with a lambda. They're actually really nice little shortcuts you can use. Um, got some more of that coming up shortly too. So event queue, invoke later, open round bracket, open and close round brackets. So here it's sort of saying we're linking something with all this code and we're not naming what we're linking. It's just empty round brackets. So it's strange looking code. Control one. So all that's commented out in the, in the main, all that's commented out in the, construct, in the constructor. We just got the event queue invoke later. Okay. So that's another way to kick off your apps. And this tends to be the more modern way that most Java textbooks recommend for uh, kicking off apps. But this way still works and putting everything in your constructor still works as well. So as long as you've got that sort of call there somewhere in, in your main. So why do it this way? Okay, there are some advantages to it. Um, if you're doing lots of operations on your, if, 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 you're, if, you're, if, you, if you click a button in your GUI and it's does a lot of processing in, a, in, a, in loops, and, um, and updating text fields and text areas and maybe a graph and all sorts of things like that, you'll see that your GUI components don't update while the processing's going on. There's, no, there's nothing inside Java that says, release, re release control of your operating system for a few milliseconds to let it do its updates, or, uh, or release control to a, to a thread that's updating my, my GUI um, controls. Um, there's nothing like that in Java. So this sort of is a step in that way to help you work work towards a sort of multi-threading approach where you, your GUI is updated in one thread and your processing happens in another thread. So that's sort of where it's heading. But um, Nice idea for us, but we don't get that far in this course. We used to, we used to do uh, a couple of weeks on uh, threading and multi-threading in, in, in our advanced Java course, but that all got chopped out. So I'm afraid so. So for this course, you can choose any of those methods, the old way, the constructor way, or the invoke later way, whatever, you, whatever works great for you, doesn't matter. Uh, so here we're doing this, the, the getting the screen size just from one monitor, assuming a single monitor system or it's only gonna do the primary monitor. And then we're setting the size of the application to half the screen height and half the screen width. And set location by platform, so that probably senders it for some operating systems, senders the application in the main screen for some operating systems. But for others, it could be the top left, set location by platform. And then display the, and then change the icon in the top left hand corner. Okay. Any questions so far on anything?
Um, so I noticed just on this screen, all of that stuff is just in the class. It's not in the constructor or. Uh, this, 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 is, this is a size frame constructor. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it is. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, but it could just be in another method. For example, up here, we could, we could say. Um, uh, that would still be okay if we, if we uncommented all this code here and just and called a method there, that would still be okay. That's, that's okay. It doesn't matter whether it's done in the constructor or one of the methods the constructor calls. That's, that's, that's all fine. Although that's super, there wouldn't be allowed down here. That would have to be up here in that first line of code up here. I'll put that back. And the way, and the way we're heading, we're going to have lots of methods creating our GUI for us. So we might have a, 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 a method that creates tab one of our tab pane, and another method that creates tab two, another method that creates tab three. So we're not having these methods that are 300 lines long or whatever. And that way, if you need to change the order of tabs or you need to change a tab, you can just go straight to that method and look at the case focus just on that area. So much better design we'll be looking at for this term as well. Okay, displaying images. And, and again, this is an example I did in the prior. Yes, they did do it in the prior course as well. Um, they like displaying this ball over and over again. It's just something that's... The textbook likes doing uh, image image equals new image icon blue ball dot gif so it's loading blue ball dot gif from the current folder it's loading it as an image icon because image icon's got the the method there to load it from file image doesn't so you load it as an image icon and then go get image no need for double semicolon one's enough and then in paint component you can you can create a paint component method and that that called uh, and then we that takes a, a graphics object as a parameter. The graphics object, which is how you link to your canvas of your of your frame. So this this frame here, uh, all this area here's your your canvas that you can draw on, and you can draw lines and draw text and draw ovals and circles and draw images, whatever you want. And then we're drawing an image. So we're drawing this image, whatever we loaded, blue ball dot gif, at location zero zero. And there's other stuff we can put here as well, but we're just calling it null. So we're just drawing the image at that location. So a blue ball will appear right here at the top left-hand corner if we have that code in. In fact, I could I could do that pretty quick. Um, yeah, okay, righto, I could do it pretty quick. There might be a little bit of extra plumbing we need to do. Uh, I'll be showing this on the next slides, paint component. Um, I'll make the image icon class data. I'll make it an instance field because it's not going to change. Public static final image icon equals that. So we're loading the image icon from file. Okay, so that's you know, static data for all our class objects to, to share. Not that that really helps much running in a great one. Um, icon. So it's g dot draw image, and it's the image we want to draw, which is icon location zero zero and null because we're not supplying the rest of the parameters. And Zero, zero, not, not the letter row, letter row. Not there yet. So we need to, we need to work out a way to call that method. Okay. And, um, still not showing up. Okay, so we'll look at that shortly. I send some of these old ones. Um, 
They can also provide other parameters as well. Here's another, another method that's useful, copy area. So the top left coordinate of the source area, the top Y coordinate of the source area. So X goes across the screen, Y comes down the screen. So zero, zero is the top left-hand corner. You might be thinking this will be, this will be a nice little origin if this, if this is our screen here. Uh, this would be a nice little origin, zero, zero, but it's not zero, zero is up in the top left here. Um, the width of the source area, the height of the source area, this, this is the width and the height you want to copy, and this is where you want to copy it to. So how far from, this, from the start of the source area? Okay, so there we got our main, just like we had before. Add new Im image component. There's an image component class down here. So this, this is doing it using multiple classes. You can do it all with one class if you like, but multiple classes is probably good because that means you can reuse it better. Um, the constructor loads an image. The paint component. Um, we set the width and height of the image. If the image is null, it returns. It doesn't paint, try and paint anything because it can't paint a null image. It would be a runtime error. And uh, draw image at that location. And then we're working across the screen and then down the screen, so a nested loop. And if the location, or if, if, the, if, if, the, yeah, if the location is uh, greater than zero, then we can copy that area to i times the width and i times the height. So we're, we're copying the icon from its top left corner to a multiple of that width and a multiple of that height with i and j. Get preferred width. Okay. So paint extends J component. And we're adding a new image component there. So it's just a J component type object, which is, and then pack. So maybe we just need to call a pack here. There's a trick to getting all this, to, to, to wiring up the paint component. It's not something that you do very often. And uh, repaint doesn't do it, pack doesn't do it. So there's some magic here that's still, and it, and it could well be that. It could well be that method that controls it. There is a trick to it anyway. Um, that's what you end up with. So you copy this little image in the top left corner to multiples of I across, and then multiples of J down, and you're doing it in a nested loop, so it fills in all the detail as well. Not something you probably wouldn't do very often. Lambdas are great. Lambda expressions are terrific. Uh, in the prior course, I showed you things like um, Y button. So instead, of, instead of going through the whole five or six or more lines of code you had to just say, just see Nicholas's. Uh, so question there, what's the use of the null? So we, we're, we're calling constructor that takes other parameters that we don't want to provide. So let's have a look at our draw image method. Draw image. And you'll see there's a whole bunch here. Look how many. <laughs> okay. So we're, we're taking one that takes an image Two integers and a null. So an image, two integers. Now that's four integers. An image is uh, an image, two integers, a color and an observer. Nope. An image, two integers and an observer. Okay, so that's the one we're calling there. Okay, so when we say g dot draw image, uh, image zero zero null, we're saying call this one. We're passing the image and then the, the top left corner of the image, the top, so the top left X and the top left Y of the image in the relative to the frame. 
and then the observer. We don't want to provide an observer, so we're just saying null for the observer. And if you want to know what an observer is, <laughs> image observer, an asynchronous update interface for receiving notifications about image information as the image is constructed. Pretty clear, eh? <laughs> Basically, they're a class of keeping an eye on stuff while you're building images. And you can do stuff like abort and all sorts of stuff. There's a whole lot of stuff you can do um, way outside the scope of this course in image observers. So we just put null there. We don't want to provide one. Okay. If you didn't want to provide, provide uh, if you didn't want to call null, the other thing you could do is go new job observer. It just creates a dummy image observer. We're not giving it a name even. That would be another way to do it. That, would, that, that should work. Okay, so back onto lambdas. Lambda. So if you if you did the um, you know, in, 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 in introductory Java course, there used to be a whole lot of code that you set to go here to wire up a method to a button. And with, when lambdas came in with Java 7, write this little bit of code here in operator, a lambda operator. Which, which links your button to your method really quickly, really easily, really quickly. It saved you four or five lines of code for each button. Okay. If you're doing a separate, um, an action performed for each button. Um, so lambdas are great. They save you a lot of code, but it's not just here you can use them. Okay, You use them to wire stuff up. And we've already done a little bit now in our invoke later here. So we're telling Java that we're setting, we're creating an event, an invoke later setup, and we're linking the default or something there to all of this code. Okay, so there's nothing inside round brackets there. There's not even a name. So we're, we're, we're linking the base of the invoke later to all of this code here, so it runs automatically when the invoke later is created. Okay, so that's a lambda operator as well. And without that, without that, this code would, would look a fair bit different. There'd be a lot of extra code here, probably, probably another three or four lines, perhaps. Okay, without lambdas. You can also do them for, uh, so lambdas are basically shorthand expressions and you can use them in place of methods. You can just have a shorthand expression. So a block of code that can be passed around so it can be executed later, once or many times. Lambda expressions in Java have the following. They've got parameters, followed by a lambda operator, followed by an expression. Uh, for example, if you want to compare two strings, um, string first and string second, you could pass two strings to a method, or you could use a lambda. Okay, and if first dot length is less than second dot length, return minus one, the first string is less than the second string. If first dot length is equal to, or is greater than second dot length, return one, so the first string's length is greater than the second, otherwise return zero. So this is, a, this is a way of comparing strings where you're comparing the length of the strings. What, what the string contains doesn't matter. It's all based on the length of the string. Okay. Um, here we're getting into, again, some quite crazy looking code. This is similar to what we've got here with evoke later. Okay, so we've got a loop embedded inside a lambda opera, a lambda expression. Um, and this is one we're more, more used to. Um, action list and listener event to a method or, it's a, or a single Java statement or a more, more, more usual just sort of code where you, where you do it for the button, add action listener event with a lambda and a method. So I want to clear my mind of all lambdas and I want to see if we can work out how to call that example we're just showing. Okay, so I've clearing my mind, clearing my mind, right, my mind's clear. Let's see if we can work out how to invoke that or how to set that up. Okay.
brackets, curly brackets, if just length is less than second dot length. This one, first string is less than a second string, else if is greater than second dot length. The first string is greater than the second string in length. We're going to return a positive value, return one. Otherwise, we're going to return zero. They're the same length. So that should be that lambda k we just looked at. Yep. And it's just dangling there in space between the methods. Let's see if that works. Let's see if we can make it work, okay? I'm just showing you how you guys can work stuff out. Okay, and uh, we're just coming out of gooey stuff for now. Let's just see, let's just focus on this lambda, see if we can make it work. Should it go there or should it go inside a method? I can't remember, my mind is clear, don't forget. <laughs> so let's put it just back, back outside a method there. And we'll say, uh, so it's, it's wanting two strings and it's gonna return, or it's linking up to a value that's gonna return. So it's gonna return negative one, one or zero. So it looks like we wanna store the result in an integer result is equal to, and we want to compare two strings. So it's going to be Mike and Frankie. So could it be that easy? Legal start. Okay, so you obviously can't have your Lambda expressions just hanging there in limbo like that. Let's now let's now try moving it inside the main method. And again, not a statement. Okay, so you can see for, for some of these things there is a little bit of plumbing to do, and you need to keep things in mind. Uh, the, the easiest way to use lambdas is just what we saw here. That's 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 the way you'll you'll hopefully be doing it for. For all, for all of your buttons and menu items and menu options and uh, click handlers and all sorts, all, all sorts of stuff. Timers, uh, if you need to create a timer. There's a timer that's every second, every thousand milliseconds, approximately, that's gonna call the update time method. Okay, so again, using a Lambda, so it's so easy. Under the GUI. That's all good. Jared just said, I think I have an extra, an extra curly. Uh, no, everything's fine. It's fine there. It's okay. So there's, a, so there's a little bit more plumbing you need to do to get that to work. It's not much plumbing. It's just a little bit more code than we've done at the moment. We'll, we'll get to that. Uh, we might even leave lambdas till next week. Okay, a bit more lambdas. So Look at some more stuff like this next week, some more advanced stuff, but I don't want to go too far because there's not much we do in this course anyway. Basically, this is all you need to know. Link, link, linking an event with a method is all you really need to know. And if you want to, see, if you want to use the, the slightly more fancy, modern way of creating Java apps, you can link them up to an event, an invoke later event queue. So Java Lambda expressions can only be used where the type they are matched against is a single method interface. Is a single method interface. For example, here, we're linking an event to a method. Here we're event linking a, a, an action event, which is a button click to, to a method. Here it's a timer event. Single method interface. A single method interface is also sometimes referred to as a functional interface. Matching a job, and, and again, functional interface is a huge area. <laughs> yeah. 
Matching a Java Lambda expression against the functional interface is divided into these steps. Does the interface have only one abstract unimplemented method? Do the parameters of the Lambda expression match the parameters of the single method? Uh, does, this, does the return type of the Lambda expression match the return type of the single method? Okay, so it's those, those sort of steps you need to think about. We could, of course, do this as a, as a um, just a method. Let's just do this as a method. So it would look like this. So, so, so that would be as, as, a, as a method, public ints, uh, compare string lengths, takes in two parameters, first and second, and, and does the compares, and then returns the value. And we could call that down here like this. Printline. Touch. Non-static, sorry, it's, it's got to be static. We're in a static context. Okay. So it returned minus one because Mike is shorter than Frankie. Okay. So you can see, even if we could get, even if we knew enough at the moment to get the uh, the lambda working, really all it's saving us is just that. That's all it's saving us. So. Um, but for a lot of, when people use Lambda sometimes, I think, why'd you do it that way? Just make it a method, a static method even. And uh, it's probably something you're gonna do, it, do again. So why don't you just throw it in a, in a utility class so you can use the method again in the future. So, but anyway, we'll, we'll come back to this either, either this week or next week. We'll see how we go. The following interface can be implemented with a Lambda expression. My goodness, we're going on interfaces already. We haven't done interface classes. Uh, public interface, my interface, void string, uh, void printed some string text. What does that remind you of? Does anyone, anyone have any memories going back to maybe a prior week? I'm talking about this sort of thing here. abstract method? Uh, yes, that's right. So it's, it's, it's looking like an abstract class and an abstract method, isn't it? That's right. So in, interfaces are a little bit along those lines as well. Um, but we'll, we've, got a, we've got a week coming up on, or a, a, a lecture coming up on interfaces and abstract classes in the future. Um, but that's right. Thanks, Wayne. Yeah. Um, print UTF-8 to the stream. So we're passing in some text. Got an output stream, and we're going to try and convert it to UTF-8 bytes. And, uh, and if it throws an exception, an I/O exception, we're going to say error writing to stream. And um, static void print to system out. We've got the text again. System out print dot text. And here we're linking an interface. So equals string dot text system.out.print.text. So here we're doing the same sort of thing with, uh, with just a, a Lambda expression. So we've got Lambda expression there. Okay, so. So we've got a Lambda expression invoking a method in an interface that we haven't covered yet. <laughs> Strange example. So a listener object is an instance of a class that implements a special interface, generally a listener interface. Okay, so let's have a look at listeners in Java. So listeners, a whole lot of listeners in Java. There's action listeners, there's, um, Mouse listeners, see the list over here on the side changing. Mouse listener, you've got change listeners, you've got item listeners. There's a whole lot of listeners built into Java. So if you need to detect when, say, the value of a component changes, you can detect it. 
if you need to detect when the user clicks on a component without clicking a button, they're just clicking inside a component like a text field, you can sense that as well. Um, if you want to have code run automatically when the user changes a text field or a button or when anything changes, you can do that as well via listeners. Okay, so they're, they're like uh, things that just sit there listening for some sort of event, whatever they might be, and then they, they can fire off code to do whatever you need. So pretty powerful stuff. There's a whole lot of listeners in Java. There's item listeners, change listeners, action listeners, mouse listeners, um, timers. Well, yeah, they're, they're not really listeners, I guess. They're more, more just timed events. Um, and other ones as well. Each, each uh, uh, and it's all linked up to an event. So an event is a source uh, of, of some sort of thing that you're monitoring, that you want to monitor or have something happen when it occurs. Um, and it's an object that can register a listener objects and send them event objects, it's like a button. A button can, um, can register action listener uh, objects and send them events when they occur. So we're just registering a listener for that button. And uh, it's an action listener, as we say action. That means when the button is clicked by the mouse or by a key press to hold the mouse, hold the button down, um, then it fires off the calc method. All these things are additive. So if I do this, then the calc button will get fired off three times. Um, and you can say, um, if you did that sort of thing, <laughs> the calc button would fire off three times, then it would save, and we call that save to file method, whatever that does, and then it would call the update display method, whatever that does. Okay, so it's not just one event. You can have as many events as you like tied to as many objects as you like. So here we've got five events tied to the one button. Okay, so, and they're all action events. So when a user clicks on it, all this code will fire off. I don't know why you want to run calc three times. So I'm just showing you an example. Whenever that event happens, the event source sends out object events to all registered listeners. The listener objects then use the information from the event object to determine their reaction to the event. Sounds pretty complex, but it's not really. It just comes down to this sort of code. So it's sort of the relationship is you're an event source, an event listener, and listener interface. Okay, so an event source is, is connected with lots of event listeners, maybe, or one, zero, one or many event listeners, and then each one of those has got a listener interface. That's sort of how it's set up. So if you want to use the, um, the action diagram, something like that, um, action listener, listener equals new my listener. So this, this is the old way that I was talking about of uh, linking a button with some, some code. So action listener, listener equals new my listener. So my listener is a separate class down here, implements action listener. In there is an action performed method. And then there's a code that runs when your button is clicked. Okay. So, and then to, to, to link the okay button, to this code, you've got to create a listener and then add the action listener for that listener, whatever that listener object is there. Add it as an action listener to your button. So you've got all this code here and that line of code and that line of code when it could just be that line of code. Replaces them all. Okay, so that's what I was talking about earlier, how this, the, the lambdas just simplified everything. Okay. So mainframe, main, uh, the main the my frame's got a, a J button, and uh, it, we've got a listener that we created, my listener. So there's a, a okay, an OK button and a, and a listener, and add action listener links the listener and the button together, so the action perform method calls the uh, the method whatever it might be. This code down here might run. Okay. 
So to replace all this code with the new way I've just showed you. So we'll replace all of this code here with a new way. Let's do that. So this is slide 21. A button, OK button, button. Of course, the label's going to be OK. OK button, add action listener to whatever. I perform whatever's going to be a little void method down here. Okay, so we've got that much code now. And uh, so one, two, three, three lines of the comments, not counting the curlies, so three lines. And it was a lot more than that before. So. Less plumbing, less complexity. That lambdas really did simplify things. That, that little operator there, wonderful. Any questions so far on anything? Any questions so far? Okay, that's good. Building a whole J-frame. <laughs> Oh, no. Okay. Oh, no. So there is a bit of sense. To, well, yes, exactly. Yes, you can see how much simpler we could make it without if we just did this over here. This sort of this sort of code. Um, so we've got a button frame that sends J frame. Uh, it's not a bad idea to set your defaults up here. Default width, default height, and then wherever you set the size, which would be on the next slide. We'll use those to set the height and the height and the width of our frame. Okay. Oh, there it is. There. Set, set, set size. Yeah, so it's using the the, the um, just just see. Okay, back again. Uh, so set the default width and default height of our frame. Uh, declare some buttons. So you can declare your buttons here. We often declare them before the before the constructor. If you don't, if you only need them down here and you don't need to use them again, in other words, they're all created inside this method, they're not created in other methods and refer to in other methods, you can create them locally inside the constructor, that's fine as well. We'll put them, put them at the top here. Either way is fine. Creating a new panel, add the yellow button, blue button, red button, add the button panel to the user interface. So button panel's got a layout of the default layout for button panel for, for J panel, which is flow layout. Okay. And then we're adding the button panel to our J frame, which has got a, a default layout of border layout. Okay, so again, I like specifying the layouts for everything to make it really clear, but they're, they're relying on the, on the default layouts here. So it's flow layout for panels and border layout for button panels or, or for, 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 the, for J frames. And we're not specifying, not specifying a region, so the default region is center. Okay, color action. Yellow action equals new color action yellow. So this is a color action class down here. There's a lot easier ways to do this. My goodness. This is this, this is like fingernails on a chalkboard for me. Color action yellow action equals new color action, color yellow. So we pass, we got it, we class down here that's uh, the color action class. And it's got a constructor that takes a color. And whatever your color you pass through here is passed through to the color C object. And background color is set to that color. So background colors class data. And whenever the method is, or whenever the, the action before method runs here, we're going to set button panel, um, which is declared up here at class level because it's used here and also in other methods. So button panel had to be declared up there. It's going to set the background color to whatever the background color is. Okay, so here there is a little bit of sanity for creating a separate class. Okay, because we've got, a, we've got things that are going on when the button is clicked and parameters to set, although there are better ways to do it. I've got to say there are better ways to do it. Much simpler. And we've got a blue action and a red action. So that's creating three color actions, which are really action listeners as well. So that's a, 
got a bit of data in there as well as there an action performed so they can react to button clicks. Okay, and then yellow button add action listener yellow action. And we can do that because it implements action listener. So we can add it as an action listener for our button because it implements action listener, which is this action perform method here. Okay. And so whenever these buttons are clicked, this code here will run. Okay. So when the red button is clicked, it'll say, uh, set the background color of the panel to whatever the color was that was passed through when this color action object was created, which for the red button was red. And then the exit, exit button, add action listener, new action listener, new event. So again, we've simplified this as well, but system.exit. So when the exit button is clicked, they just exit the method. So again, this, this code here, we've got one, two, three lines of code with some curly brackets and some nasty stuff going on. We could replace all that with, this is slide 22. The exit button. Event. System dot exit zero. Okay, so we can replace all that exit button code, which is this nice little lambda expression. So. All that, all that red stuff there with that one line. Much, much simpler in it. So that's, that's where Lambda's coming to their own. They, they can help you simplify all this nasty code <laughs> and shrink it down. And um, yeah. So when, when Lambda's came in, Java, Java programmers all around the globe were saying, why didn't you implement them earlier? <laughs> it's just saved, saved so much horrible code like this. Okay. And, um, oh, so there we go. So this is now part of the slides. System.exit zero. Um, and instead of doing all that stuff for each button, you could just create a make button method and uh, pass through a name of the button and a background color and then just call make button, make button yellow for color yellow, make button blue for color blue, make button red for color red. So that's the label and it's the color it's changing to. And that runs this code down here. So it creates a new button, sets the name according to whatever you pass in, adds a button to a panel, which is a button panel, and then adds the action listener, set the background color to the color that's passed in. Much better way to do it. Uh, Or if even that was a bit too hard, if you thought that was a bit too hard, you could do it in even, an even different way, slide 23, 123, you could say J button, yellow button. button. Yellow button, dot add action, let's just copy that. Event. What's the panel called? Button panel. No, it's called the yeah, button panel. Right, eh? Ground. Ground. Background is lowercase g. It always looks wrong with lowercase g. So that's, that's basically what you're doing for each button. Creating a button, setting it so it's the background color of some, some panel somewhere and then adding it to a panel. That's all that method's doing. So. Part two. So we'll have a quick five minute break. We'll have a five minute break. So we'll come back at about 10, 10 past 10. Okay, so I see you at 10, 10. Um, so. Grab some oxygen, grab some water, grab a coffee if you want, and we'll come back shortly. 
Okay, welcome back. Can you hear me okay? Sound coming through? Yeah, all good. Okay, thank you. So part two. Okay, some on, on to some more uh, hopefully fun stuff. So board layout, grid layout, exterior with scroll panes, J sliders, dialogue boxes and menus. So that's what we're coming up. So the board layout's got the five regions. It's got the, the centre, which is, it strives to make the biggest area, north, south, east and west. Okay, so how you add stuff. Slide 26. When you, if you want to, if you've got a J frame, you want to set, set it to border layout, you just go set layout. Okay, set layout, new border layout. Although by default, J frame, board layout. It's already got a board layout, so there's no need to specify it really for J frames. Although I like doing it anyway, just to make it clear. <clears throat> so if you want to add, uh, say you've got a button and you want to add to the um, to the to the to the north area of your user interface or your J frame, you just go add my button. Layout dot north, so it's got to be uppercase, highly case sensitive. If you've got a panel and you want to add to the center region, you can do that, or you can do this. Okay, so either of those that will add it to the center region. Same for south, east, and west. Uh, um, so it's got to be center, C N T R. Okay, Java's American, so C N T R E won't work. <laughs> it's got to be center, of course, and uh, make sure it's uppercase B, uppercase L, and the only import you need for border layouts import Java. Dot awt. Dot star. That brings in all of the abstract window toolkit class and part of that is border layout and flow layout and grid layout and other layouts as well. So pretty easy stuff border layout. And, uh, so you got the five regions there and um, each region can only contain one component. So each region regions. Okay, so that's why you need to create panels and work with panels. Panels are just containers for one or more other GUI components or other panels. And uh, so you build things up in the panels and then add the panels or the panel to each region of the border. And that gets you around that can contain only one component issue. Because it's not really useful having one button in the, in, the, in the north. You should generally want lots of buttons. So add the buttons to a panel and then add the panel to the north or the south or wherever you want it. So there's constants there built into the border layout class. The default is center, so that's why this works for center. Either one of those will work center. All components expand to fill the available space. So if you add a single button to south, it will expand to fill the entire south region, which is a long skinny region along the bottom. If you added that button to the, to, the, to the center, it would be a great big button here in the center. Fill up the whole, whole center region. And if there's nothing in the west and the east, the center expands to fill up those regions as well. And if there's nothing in the north or the south, the center will expand to fill up those regions as well. Okay, so the center, the center hogs, hogs in most space and it expands out if there's nothing in those other regions. So you don't need anything, anything to the west or the east, center will expand all the way out to the edges of your J frame. Uh, if you try and add more than one component to a region, then the original component will get kicked out. So if I do this, uh, 
my button one, my button two, all will see. My button two. My button. Okay, so whatever, whatever the button was or whatever the component was you added last is the one that stays. Okay, so, so really to work with layout managers, you need to, to work with panels. And they're really easy to work with. I'll, I'll do an example soon. They're really easy to work with. They're just containers that contain GUI components or other, or other panels. Oops, more layout. So the solution is to add a panel to the southern region and all the, add, a, add all the buttons to that panel. Example doing this sort of stuff. J panel, panel equals new J panel. The default layout for panels is flow layout and it's centered flow layout. So that all the buttons appeared centered. Panel.add, panel.add, panel.add. So adding the yellow, then the blue, then the red. The yellow, then the blue, then the red. They appear in the order you add them. And then you can add that panel to the border layout south. So frame.add panel. That's a panel we've added them to. Border layout south. Let's do that over here. So we'll take out our static stuff. It's getting a bit of mess, getting a bit messy, but anyway, we're we're having a good old play around here. And we'll reinstate this. Reinstate this code down here. Okay, so we've got a, the invoke later. That's all in our main. And then our constructor. Take those out. Now the default layout, default layout for panels is flow layout center. But if you want to specify that as well, you can. So you go new flow layout, flow layout dot center. And then next round bracket. Okay, so that's, that's the default layout by default for panels. So you don't have to specify that. But I like making it clear because I end up with bunches of panels. Some have got grid, some have got border, some have got flow. Just, just nice to make it clear that when you're building interfaces, especially, especially with people that might work on your code later that might not have quite as much experience, might not realize what the default is. Okay, let's create some buttons and I'll create the buttons up here where we usually create them, J button. My button, my button one, my button. One, two, three. Two, three, two, three. Let's add those to the buttons panel. It's really hard. You go buttons panel dot add. What are the buttons you want to add in the order you want them? Two, three, and then you add the buttons panel to the south region of our user interface, which is what this is referring to anyway. This is the, this object. So we can say add buttons panel to border. South, or if you want to be even clearer, you could say this dot. In other words, for the current object, which is our class object that extends JFrame. Either of those are fine. You can put this in front if you like, or just leave it out. It's understood that that means for the current object or current user interface. Control one, control two, and there's our buttons down here. Okay, so they're really easy to work with panels. Um, if you want to put these two but buttons together and then a space between that one and this one. You could just create another label, create a label and add a label, or just create an anonymous label, J label. I don't, want, I don't even want to give it a name, it's just a spacing label, so I'll just give it, I'm just creating an anonymous label there with a couple of spaces in it, and that'll just space things out a bit. So there's a gap. So you can have like these two buttons belong together and then this one belongs a little bit on its own. You can increase the spaces if you want to. Okay. Um, whole lot of stuff you can do with panels. You can put borders around them. You can put etched borders. You can put titles. You can do a whole lot of stuff. So you can make it so all your components are grouped together and have titles and nice little uh, borders around them. So you can make things make a lot more sense. For example, uh, I've got a little bit of watering going on here. Not much. Um, so look at this one. 
So you can see I've got borders going around here with a with a title. So there's a border around all these checkboxes with a title, another border around these radio buttons with a title, another border around these radio buttons with another title. So it's just so that they group together. So all these options belong together and all these options belong as sort of a single unit. Okay, and I'm using tab panes. See, I've got different tab panes happening. And different different tab panes there. So you're going to have multi-levels of tab panes. That's all really easy. I'll show you how to do all this sort of stuff. Okay, but all, all I saw about there was the, uh, the, H, the borders and the, and the titles, which you can add to panels really easily. The grid layout arranges things in rows and columns. So let's, let's do that as well. So I'll, I'll create another panel called grid panel, grid panel. And the way you do it is you say new grid layout and you can specify the number of rows. So I'm gonna have three rows and four columns. And if you want, if you want gaps between the, the items of the grid, you can specify gaps as well. For example, a five pixel horizontal gap and a 20 pixel vertical gap if you want to. Okay, so the parameters are rows and columns and then the row gap or horizontal gap and then the vertical gap or the parameters. Not very often you'll use those ones, but you might want to space things out a bit. I'll just leave those off for now. Just leave it with the three rows, four columns. Okay, so let's add some, let's create some more buttons or whatever you want. Um, let's create an array of buttons. J button. Since, we, since we're all good at working with arrays now, let's create an array of buttons. J button buttons. J button. How many do we want? So we've got three rows and four columns, so we want 12 buttons. Okay. So you know, I, you know I hate having those, that 12 there and those there, that fingernails on a chalkboard. Let's make constants. Rivet. Int. Rows. Three. It doesn't matter what it is. Num calls or use num row. Use num rows down here. Three and num calls down there is four. And then we can use that multiply here so that we get the right number of buttons to fill our grid. No matter what they change these two, it will always adapt to fill the grid. Okay, just just better than running out of buttons or having too many. Okay, let's create that create the grid panel. Int k is equal to zero. K is less than our buttons dot length, the length of our array. K plus plus. Let's create each button. So each 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 object in the array is a button. By default, they're null. So we need to create the button, and we do that with the same sort of code like this. Okay, but we're going to use array notation at the start here. It's going to be button zero, button one, button two. Okay. Buttons, buttons K is our index. Okay, so that's creating all the buttons. And we want to give it a number here based on the value of K plus, plus one. Okay, and I did K plus one because I don't want the button starting at zero. I can be button one, button two, button three. So that's created the button. Now we're going to add them to our panel. So that's grid panel dot add. Okay. And if we also had activate it, if we also had to make it so it ran some code, we could say buttons k dot add action listener. And whatever the method is you want to call. Okay. But I don't have any code to run yet, so I'm just going to leave it that it does nothing. Okay, create the buttons and activate them and add them to the user interface all in one loop. And then it's just a matter of adding the, the grid panel to the center region. So it's going to be grid panel to the center. Okay, so just a quick recap. We've created an array of buttons there based on our rows and columns. Number of rows, number of columns. And we've created a grid layout panel 
with a grid according to the number of rows and the number of columns. Okay, so if we've got three by four, that means 12. So we've got a row of size 12 here. Then we're looping through our array length and we're creating each button and giving it, giving it a name of button with a number, which is K plus one, our index plus one. So we start at one, not start at zero. Add the button to the user interface or our panel, gridpanel.add. And then we could activate it if we wanted to, but I don't have any code yet, so we'll leave it like that for now. And then we're adding our grid panel after we've created it, we're adding it to the border layout center. Control one, control two, and there's our buttons. So they're big buttons, but they resize if you resize stuff. Okay. Probably that looks best, something like that. But, uh, okay, so that's that's working with uh, grid layouts. They're really easy. Um, you don't have any control over where you add an item to the to the grid. It just adds them in the order you add them. So it starts in the top left and goes across until that row's full, or until that column's full. Sorry, until <laughs> until that row's full, then it goes down to the next row. And fills up the next row and then goes into the next row and fills up the next row. Okay, so this adds them in the order you add them. And that's all that's doing there. So you can see pretty easily you could, you, you could create a calculator interface fairly easily just by using a grid layout and uh, so you get the, the numbers and then the operators and whatever going on. And uh, a grid layout of four by four would let you create a very simple calculator like that. A text field at the top and uh, 16 buttons should be enough for a simple calculator. So not, not, not a bad little exercise to do. If you're looking for a, a fun little project to do, create your own calculator. You'll find a user interface is easy and then it comes to programming. What happens when you click the buttons? So you've got to think a little bit about that because you want to uh, try and make it so you've got, uh, well, yeah, anyway, see how you go. Text areas and scroll pane. So text fields are a single line of text. Text areas are multiple lines of text. Um, you, can, you can do a whole lot of stuff with text areas. So text areas. To declare them, you go J text area, my text area. New J text area. You can give them a rows and columns here, five, ten, so five rows approximately and ten columns approximately visible. Although that's not very often you do that. Okay, especially when you talk about uh, what, we're, what we're doing now. That was something we did originally when we first started working with text areas in the prior course. But um, now you don't generally do that. You, add, you generally add them to a, a scroll pane. Scroll pane, J scroll pane. Scroll pane. Scroll pane. So text area. Okay. Oh, that's that's a basic constructor we're running. Well we're, pass, well, we're passing in the, the component to view, which is our text area. But there are other constructors as well. You can also specify the, the vertical scroll bar, the VSB policy, the vertical scroll bar policy, and the horizontal scroll bar policy. Okay. And the way you do that is you can say um, visible always and all sorts of things. Is, so you can also do it this way. My scroll pane, set vertical scroll bar policy, and you say and that means the scroll bars are always visible, no matter what. Okay, so um, 
We can do that. We can add that to our to our code. Let's do that. So we'll create our GUI components up here, and then we'll add them down in our constructor with that sort of code. So let's do the scroll bar. So the we'll add my scroll pane. Add that to the border layout east or north. Let's add it to the north. Okay, so I've created the scroll pane or created the text area, added the text area to the scroll pane. My text area equals new scroll pane, J, my text area. That adds a text area to the scroll pane. And then down here we set the scroll bar policy for the vertical. I could set the horizontal as well. Same sort of code, it's horizontal scroll bar always. And, uh, and add the scroll pane to a region of the user interface. So I'm going to get the border layout north. Control one, control two. And you can see it's there, it's very skinny. <laughs> but, but it is there. And you can see the scroll bar is visible. Okay. But uh, not much we can do with it because these buttons are taking over everything. So what we can do to make it a bit clearer is to let's add our grid panel to our north and our scroll pane to our center. Just swap these over, make that north and that center. Just do the swaparoo. Okay, so now we can see the scroll bar. And those buttons look a bit better too. So by default, you can type text into text areas. And you can see when I get down the bottom here, so I've typed in all this text now, and the scroll bar is still not active. But when I get past this next line, it suddenly becomes active. See, it's just suddenly turned on. See the scroll bar is shrinking down to show you how much text is in there. So you can use that to scroll around. But if you delete that text again, the scroll bar becomes inactive again. So it's always there, but it's only active when it needs to be, which makes sense. Okay, so by default, text areas are not read only. So if you want them to be read only, you can do that as well. You can say, so it's not the scroll pane, you need to go back to the text area. My text area. Set read only to true. Set editable. Editable to false. Set editable. Sorry, I was doing some. some I was doing some other stuff. <laughs> so now, if I click on the text area and type, I, I can't type anything. So nothing's coming in the text area. Uh, if you want to, I'll, I'll turn it off now just so I can do some wrapping of text. Uh, and let's show it on the slide here. So you can, you can set line wrap to true to make it so it wraps lines. Um, um, a lot of stuff you can do. Generally, you don't specify the size. That's sort of the old way of doing stuff. Now, you've got, now you know about scroll panes. Add them to a scroll pane. Let the scroll pane take care of the sizing. Bit of code here. So it doesn't always have scroll bars. I've already showed you the scroll bars. So we're adding it to the scroll pane. And then we're setting the scroll bar policy somewhere. Noob. So a label, um, a text field that's in the north panel. So we label your name in a text field in the north panel. And then a text area in the scroll pane. I don't know why you'd set a size and then add it to a, to, to a scroll pane. That seemed backward to me, but add the scroll pane to the center. And then um, add an action listener for the display button to your name is uh, text field get text. So whatever you type into the text field gets added to the your name is and appended to the text area with a new line at the end. And there's actually a round bracket missing there. There should be another round bracket. <clears throat> uh, okay. And sometimes you'll see people using this pack command. This pack command gets Java to, um, so if you, if you set a size of your user interface to whatever, pack will try and optimize the layout of the user interface. So it'll try and shrink things down to the bare size needed. We can, we can have a run of that if you like. I'll just run it quickly. There we go. That's, that's what it looks like when we do it. Let's now do a pack. <laughs> I 
and not much different in this case. In fact, no different. Okay, but uh, it can it can cause it to shrink quite a lot. If we had to, maybe if we had those buttons back in the centre region, it would shrink it down a lot. Okay, depends on what you're doing. Okay, so that's that code. There. There's a lot of code just to add your name, your name is, and, and whatever you type into the text field to a to a to a, uh, a text area, just depend it on. Sliders are quite useful. So sliders. Um, Just trying to think the last time I used a slider. Um, let me show you an example. And it was when I was doing the, uh, the golden ratio, which is maths. Golden ratio, which is probably the last time. Sorry about the, the sudden graphics on the screen. So this, this little lap I wrote to explore the golden ratio. And you can change colors and stuff and have it so it's random. And uh, you can use these scrolls down here to set the, set the pedal, the pedal radius, so the, the radius of each little tiny dot. Get some really easy patterns and the spacing, the facing of the pad, pad, pedals. And they're, you know, they're spaced far apart, now they're getting closer together. The number of pedals, so you have more or less, and so on. You can scroll forwards and backwards and stuff. <clears throat> So that's um, that's sliders in, in, in Java. They're quite they're quite powerful. You can put text labels under them, uh, or you can put graphics under them as well. And you can specify the major ticks and the minor ticks and whether you paint ticks or not. Um, you can have it so when you're sliding the slider, it can snap to the next major tick or minor tick, whatever you want to do. So snap the ticks, uh, whether paint labels are on or not, um, whether you paint the tracks or whether the tracks visible or not. That little track underneath the slider. Uh, set inverted to true, so you can set it so it's a reverse order. You can set vertical, you can make it so they're vertical sliders, not horizontal sliders. A whole lot of stuff you can do. Okay. And, uh, they, and they're pretty easy to work with, really. A um, bit harder than buttons and labels, but they're not, not that difficult. So that's setting up a vertical slider there. Swing components or swing constants dot vertical. And then you've got the min and max values you want and the initial value of the slider. So you can say min of zero, max 100. The initial value is 50 if you wanted to, whatever. Okay, and then just set that slider to user interface. Let's do it. Let's create a slider. Zero to 100, and we want it to be the default value of 25. Something like J slider swing constants vertical, vertical, yep. Min max initial, yep, that looks pretty good to me. Let's add it to the to the west region. We're adding the, the slider to our rest region of our user interface. So let's do that. And there it is. It's there, but it's pretty skinny. Okay. So a whole lot of stuff we could do here. We could we could turn the, the, the paint ticks on. We could turn and all sorts of things. We could add labels to the to the things that's got labels there. Whole lot of stuff we could do. So here there here, here there's a, a bunch of options. You can you can see the examples. There's um Plane with ticks turned on, snap to ticks, so it snaps to the next tick if you're halfway between them, with no track, inverted, labels, with custom labels, so you can specify whatever labels you want, or even icons. Okay, so you can do a whole lot of really powerful stuff there. Probably the most common one you'll do is just set, it, set labels on there with a, with a track label. A little bit complicated to do. Um, you need to create a special component and uh, and then put put labels inside that component and there's a missing round bracket there and a missing round bracket there which uh, means you won't work at this stage okay you can also add a listener to the to the slider add change listener so when the user slides it you can make it so something over here or something over here or something else 
updates or this little value down here updates automatically when they slide it. You can have it say all that happens with the change listener. Uh, so pretty powerful stuff. Not something you use very often for, for sliders, but they can be useful sometimes. So again, we've got two weeks to cover all this stuff. So we might come back and have a look at sliders next week. And we'll have a look at the, um, we'll have a look at getting this Lambda stuff working next week too. So all this Lambda stuff we talked about earlier, we'll get that working next week. So we've got two weeks on all this stuff, so don't worry. Dialog boxes we've already done, but uh, we're gonna talk about different types now. So they can be used to get information from the user. You can have modal dialog boxes, which means the user can't interact with whatever invoked the dialogue until after the dialogue is closed. So the user cannot interact with the remaining windows or the application until the modal dialogue is closed or completed. One example of that's the J option pane. So they're, they're modal by default. But you can also create your own modalist dialogue boxes with J frame or whatever you like. And the user can, can enter information in both the dialogue box and the remainder of the application. So they can inter interact with both at the same time. So modal means once the dialogue appears, the main application is locked out until they dismiss the dialogue. Modeless means that you can interact with multiple things at once. The, the dialogue, the application, whatever you like. So this kookaburra is going outside like crazy here. It's a bit distracting. I hope it's not disturbing the video, but this kookaburra is just outside there. Going absolutely crazy. We can't hear him. You can't hear them? Oh, that's good. Yeah, they're just outside on my left there and it's really <laughs> distracting. Um, so you've got show message dialogue, show confirm dialogue, show option dialogue, and show input dialogue. So these are the dialogues we looked at last term. Um, I'm, not sure if we did I'm not sure if we did show option dialogue, but we certainly did message confirm and input dialogue. We did, did all those. Um, and you can have different icons showing as well for your message dialogue. You can have an error message icon, a warning message icon, all sorts of things like that. Um, yes, there's the icon there that appears by default, and you can have it so it's a question message or an error message, and that changes it to an error an error message error icon there, and you can put a warning message which changes it to uh, like a warning triangle, and so on. So you can do lots of stuff. You have some control over the buttons. You can say OK and cancel, OK and cancel, or you can say yes, no, or you can just leave it at the default, and it will put yes, no there, or whatever, or OK, cancel, or whatever. The default is. Uh, the input dialog has an additional component for user input um, and it can be a text field or a combo box. Okay, so uh, oh, <laughs> and that's all I talk about there so that's the end of that one so we might do that next week as well. Um, input dialog, combo box. Well, lambdas, We'll also look at some J slider stuff where we make a bit of a list for next week of what we'll do. Um, so we'll come back and look at that. There's no example on it, so I'll add one for next week. Uh, menus, so menus are very useful as well. Menus, so you can have menus like across the top here. So you've got a menu bar and then you've got menu options. So there's menu options, and then you've got menu items, and these are all the menu items. And you can have sub menus in there, you can have radio buttons and uh, check boxes, and you can have uh, icons, and you can have all sorts of things going on in here. Okay, so you can do, do some really powerful stuff. You can have, it's not just text you can have, you can have text and icons or icons only, or text as well, and all sorts of things. So really powerful stuff. Um, and you can have pop-up menus. So you can have, Menus, or you can have pop up menus. So when, when the user right clicks on the, on something, they can get a pop up menu. With all the just traditional, traditional menus like here with Textpad. Okay. Um, so a, a menu bar is a bar at the top there, that's a menu bar. And that might have pull down menus on it, and menu items, and sub menus, and all sorts of things. So when a pull down menu name is clicked, it's menu items are displayed. And when your menu item is clicked, then all the menus are closed 
and the messages sent to the program. Okay, and basically just runs a action an, an action event, just like our buttons do. The way the way of, the way of dealing with button uh, menu clicks is the same as dealing with buttons. So building a menu, you start off with a menu bar, J menu bar, menu bar equals new J menu bar. And you've got to set that menu bar as a menu bar for your application. So it might be frame.set, or else if you were running that in your constructor, it would just be set menu bar, set J menu bar. Don't have to worry about the frame dot if it's in your constructor. And uh, set the menu bar to whatever menu bar you just created. And then you can create menus, for example, J menu, edit menu equals new J menu. And you can add menus to the menu bar, menu bar dot add, edit menu. So we're adding the edit menu to the menu bar. Okay, so pretty easy stuff. And then you can create menu items. For example, menu item paste item equals new J menu item paste. And you can give it text, you can give it an icon, or you can give it text and an icon. Okay, or you can make it a checkbox, or you can make it a radio button, you can do a whole lot of stuff. Okay. And then you, if you want to add that menu item, the paste item to the edit menu, you say edit menu dot add paste item. Um, I don't. I don't agree with this line here. I don't think that was going to work at all. There's an error in that. That's that's incorrect. Just just keep it that way. That's much better. This is wrong. Um, if you want to add a, add a menu separator, for example, these menu separators. You see the the menu separator separating the bunches of commands. You do that with the add separator command. Add separator, all lowercase. Um, if you want another, if you want another menu, J menu uppercase M, naughty slide uppercase M. Options menu equals new J menu options, and edit menu dot add options menu. So here we're adding a sub menu to the options to the edit menu, just like we saw over here. So we're adding the options menu. To the edit menu. Okay, so we're just adding menu, we're just adding another me edit menus and menu, a J menu, and options menu is just a J menu as well. Wrong case, that's an error. Okay, so um, add the options menu to the edit menu, and then to weigh the, to weigh the link them together. So to, to make the paste paste, what they call it, paste, paste item, add action list. Now that, that's the easy way to do it. And then you just have to make the code for that method, uh, private. in the code and away you go. Um, well that's the old way to do it if you'll do it the old way. Um, and here we're adding an exit menu as well. So exit item equals new J menu item exit and exit item dot add action listener event system exit zero. So we're just going to exit the program. Um, if you want to add an icon to it, there's a you can you can add some text and an icon using similar code to this new image icon cut dot gif. That'll look for that icon in the or that gif file in the current directory where you're working. So that'll put the if it, if it cuts a little pair of scissors, it'll put the scissors next to the cut text. Uh, checkboxes, checkbox menu item. So there's a special menu item type called checkbox menu item. And uh, read only, and then options.add read only. Okay, so similar sort of code as to dealing with normal menu, menu items, but it's just got checkbox there in front of it. Uh, radio button menu items displays a radio button next to the name. Radio button items have to be added to a group. So they're, they're like checkbox menu items, but you add them to a group and that gives you the round icon. Or the round, uh, the round, you know what I mean? It's round here instead of square. 
and only and only one of those add them to a group, and only one of those can be selected or checked at a time. If you if you check this one, this one becomes unchecked, just like just like radio buttons do. So there's a button group, there's a radio button menu item, insert item, overtype item, so J radio button menu items, and then there's our group. So we're adding them to a group so they act as a single unit. If one becomes checked, the other one becomes unchecked and so on. If there's many there, you could add many. And then you gotta add them to the menu as well. So add them to a group and then add them to the menu as well. Okay. So pop-up menus are a little bit harder. Pop-up menus. So you create a J pop-up menu option uh, component or pop-up menu, whatever you want to call it. And then you can add your, add your menu items and stuff to it, just like you did before. You can have the same menu options and menu items and check boxes and things you had before. You can add all, do, all, do all that sort of stuff the same. Uh, but then you've got to say pop-up menu.show uh, a parent, and then the X and Y where you want it to appear. So this is where it gets a little bit tricky. You've got to draw a little bit of, you have to do a little bit of thinking here. And then you've got to set the, Set the pop-up menu for your application with a set component pop-up menu, pop-up menu. And, uh, now these things can be a little bit fussy. If you've got a, a user interface here filled with text areas and, and buttons and you right click on the text area, do you want the pop-up menu to appear? Okay. And if you do, then you might need to add it to not just the, not, not just the frame, you might need to add it to panels and other components as well. So you might be adding a pop-up menu as a, as a pop-up menu for various components. So that's where it gets a little bit complicated. Sorry, so the kookaburras have stopped and now there's dogs barking. <laughs> dear, oh dear, right here. Uh, okay, anyway, we're gonna have a, have a look at more on pop-up menus next week as well. So I'll add pop-up menus to the list, pop-up. List and anything else you want, of course, as well. Uh, mnemonics are just like accelerator keys. So instead of um, going up and selecting the file menu, you could just go Alt F. Okay. And you can do that with the set, set mnemonic. If you said that, okay, then I usually stutter over that bit. Set mnemonic to H. And then they can, you can use Alt H to, um, well, it, gives, it puts a little underline there so you can go Alt H to jump to it. And you can also set uh, accelerator keys as well, which gives you hot keys. So open menu, set accelerator, keystroke.getstroke, control O. So control O makes that the open menu accelerator key. So you can just go control O to run it then. Okay. So. Pretty powerful stuff. You can assign accelerator keys. Um, sometimes useful. Accelerator keys tend to be used less. They used to be really big in the, uh, in the old days, but um, they sort of fade out now. They're still here in Textpad tools. Few views to with a. And then there's some accelerator keys assigned to these menus, Shift F11 and Control Q, V and so on. So there's still some accelerator keys there. Not quite used as often as they were. Uh, if you want to disable a menu item, you can do set enabled to false. Um, okay, so it's no longer enabled and set enabled to true again if you want to enable it. So just like you can with buttons and text fields and Whatever else, so all this, this set enabled works for other GUI components as well. And that's it for this week. So it's 10.54 and I know you've got another class to go to. Um, are there any questions before we head off? So if, okay, none so far. So I'll continue on with these things next week and also anything else you want. So. Anything not sure of, anything you're confused by, anything you'd like me to go over again, um, bring that along next week and we'll do it next week. Okay. Well, thanks for coming everyone. Thanks to Wayne and Damien and Jared and uh, everyone else. And Amy and Felix, yeah, thank you. And uh, 
get lots of practice programming and uh, see you next week.